Welcome everyone to SEO Office Hours. My name is Michael Chidsey. I'm an SEO here at Good Signals. And part of what we do, along with special guests, are these office hour sessions where people can jump in and ask their questions around their website and web search. By the way, nobody here is in the hot seat and we might not know all the answers, but multiple heads thinking about a problem should help. We have a bunch of questions submitted, as you can see, which we can go through. But if there's anybody here on the call that would like to ask any questions, please feel free to just flag yourself in the chat functionality, which will be monitored. Um, and also, please feel free to share your perspectives. I think one of the best things about SEO office hours isn't just um, us talking, but actually there's usually a load of SEOs on the call um, that give just as good, if not better advice. So feel free to sort of share um, in the chat as we go, and that will be summarized as well. Like every week with me today is Joe Juliana Turnbull, also known as SEO Joe Blogs. Morning. <laughs> Hello, Mike. Hello, everyone. <laughs> it looks like we have a very busy SEO office hours here today. I just wrote in the chat, um, let us know where you're dialing in from. And we have someone coming in from New Zealand. So hello, Dean, dialing in from New Zealand. That is the furthest east we have had so far. And I think actually just going on the number of people so far in the chat, I think we have our biggest yet beating last week. And uh, yeah, as Mike said, I'm SEO Joe Block. So I run a digital remote consultancy business called turn global we have offices here where i'm dialing in from uh barcelona and we also have one in brisbane we help clients with their marketing and we focus on working with fintech finance and SaaS brands and in my free time i also run search london a networking group for those in seo ppc and social media and our next event is actually happening in person on monday june 17th at in central london and i'll share the link with everyone later. And today I'm really happy to have back on the show today, Ulrika. Ulrika joined us at the very first SEO Office Hours. Uh, thank you much for joining us, Ulrika, on the show again today. Thank you and happy to be back. This is such a lovely thing to do, a webinar to, to attend. I love it. I love the efforts that you do, all of you. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And for those that don't know, Erika is the founder of a Sweden-based SEO agency called Unicorn. Uh, they work with e-commerce sites to achieve their organic search goals. They focus on international SEO and user-centric enterprise SEO. They put the user at, actually, at the heart of what they do. Ulrika is also a frequent speaker at events all over the world, including Brighton SEO, SEO Vibes, and of course, coming on our show. I will share the link so you can connect with Arika on um, LinkedIn. And I want to say a big thank you and welcome to Morty for joining us on SEO Office Hours. Hello, Morty. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Thanks for having me. So Morty is the head of SEO brand at Wix, and he's working to position the, work brand, the Wix brand as a leader in the SEO space. He currently works on the hosting side of multiple SEO podcast, including the Wix Serps Up podcast, which I think we mentioned last week. And he also uh, set up the SEO Rant podcast, and they actually have 118 episodes. You set that back up in uh, 2020. So uh, very impressive, 118 so far. And also outside of this, Morty attends and speaks at many industry events. And I'll share the link and how you can connect with Morty in the chat. So over to you, Mike. Amazing. Well, let's let's get cracking. OK, um, first question. Right. Uh, it's a big one. Here we go. Um, in our category templates, uh, there exists a button that directs users to subcategory pages. This button is visible on desktop, but remains hidden on mobile devices. With Google's recent announcement that there will that they will cease crawling desktop versions of websites, will this affect the crawlability of such elements? Interestingly, using Chrome's mobile view when um, and inspecting the element, the button is present even though it remains invisible. Um, so there's a button. It wasn't um, isn't isn't there on mobile, but is on desktop. Is that a problem? Um, Orika, are you happy to kick off? Yes, please. This is something that I work with almost every time I have a new client. Um, so actually, the mobile ver version versus the desktop version doesn't really matter here. Uh, it is if the button has a link or not. Is there an AHF or not? 
uh, and it's in the rendered code, then even though the actual visual part of the button is not visible on the mobile version, it doesn't really matter. As long as the link to the designated page that it should lead to is rendered in the code, then it will get, get picked up by search bots. So to answer your question is, if, if the button is only uh, like a button and it's, a, it's a, an element that is, when you click on it, there's some JavaScript loading and it doesn't really have a proper link, then it's not useful for either desktop or mobile. But if it does have a link to the page that it is linking to, uh, so this subcategory page, then it is useful both in desktop and in mobile, even though it is not visible in the mobile version. Does it make sense? Yes. Uh, Mordi, do, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think there's in the, in the premise of the question, I think maybe there's a, a, a misconception. I think, I, I'm, I'm, I believe what was being referenced here is that Google said that if you have a website where the mobile version doesn't function on mobile, like you can't access it, then they won't index that website. I believe if I'm correct, and please double check me on this, I have a terrible memory for this stuff, that Google yep. only said way back when a few months ago, I think, that they're slowing down using the desktop crawler, but not eliminating it. So I, I again, I'm pretty sure that's right. Double check me on that. Yeah, I think so too. But in this case, since it's so specifically like the button, uh, I think it shouldn't, the person shouldn't worry too much about that statement if they do have a mobile version. If they don't have a mobile version, that is a different case and that is more severe, like get a mobile version or something that works on mobile. You have to have that. Also, it's entirely possible, Today. for example, that like if you have like the button there on desktop and then when you do the mobile version, like that button doesn't work there and you want to do like an in-link. Mm. Like, it, it is, there is room to rethink your mobile version of your website. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one exact, 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 100% match. Uh, exactly. Yeah. If it doesn't work on mobile because of the formatting, then don't be like, oh no, and now Google's going to see a disparity between the mobile and the desktop version. Do what makes yeah. sense for the website functioning. Yeah, exactly. And and have everything in the render code. That is also important. Great. Uh, Joe, do you have any thoughts? Well, actually, we just have some comments from the chat. I think what they, what Ulrike and Morty said is great. So I have nothing to add there. Just uh, want to share what everyone's been saying. And thanks, everyone, for also being so interactive in the chat. It's great to have this feedback from our questions. Chris mm -hmm. is saying, like, uh, although we are mobile first indexing now, that is exactly how I read it as well. So, um, yeah, I think we need to also think about the users, so user-centric approach, uh, one of unicorns. Yeah, uh, users yeah. first, actually, yeah. Users first. Do you want to sell things? Have things that lead to those pages? Yeah, I, I guess if it's um, you know, if the subcategories feel quite important. So um, to me, yeah. it would make sense to just have them visible on the mobile version anyway. Um, I, I think if you're if you're really worried about whether um, whether it's being seen by um, search engines, you can just go and inspect the element. Uh, the inspect the page in Google Search Console and actually have a look and see if it's there. But um, my preference would just be if it's if it's an important part of your website and an important section, um, why why wouldn't you make that element appear? Um, yeah, make, yeah, make it easy for the user. And Natalia also also has a very good point. Um, she's seeing more mobile crawling activity in Google Search Console in the last couple of days and weeks. It seems like Google Bot uh, potentially is catching up uh, with this change. Great. Okay. Next question. As part of our marketing strategy, we, we're investing heavily in video content, such as interviews, webinars, training sessions, product demos, workshops, and behind the scene footage to expand our audience reach. Would you recommend hosting the videos on, the, on your website, um, utilizing platforms like YouTube, um, or conducting live social media broadcasts? Additionally, should we repurpose the content and release it as podcast episodes. Um, who would like to tackle this one? I can I'll give I can, it to Morty. you've got like however I many mean, podcasts. <laughs> I'm just going to say like, you're asking the Wix guy, like, should I host content on my website? I feel like maybe I'm a little biased about hosting content <laughs> on websites. Um, I think that you should, oh, if you don't just have it on, on YouTube, obviously I think YouTube is the best place to host your, your video content. 
it does seem like it is really hard for Google to pick up now and showing the just the video tab that web page content is video uh, primarily video content. It's not easy, I think, to get Google to to see that. But leaving that aside for a minute, you control the narrative on your website. So I always feel like it's great to have the content on the website in an ecosystem that you you control. I think you should repurpose everything. I don't think it's just about SEO and blah blah blah. You really want to create a digital presence for yourself. It's just my approach to marketing. You want to have digital momentum and digital cadence and digital whatever, a digital light. And I think that works for SEO. I think it helps your SEO. I think Google, the way I describe it, I hope it's not offensive to Google, John. Google's like a moth, but in a good way. It's a, it's attract it's attracted to the to digital light, and all of the things that you do for your for your website and for your business that speak to online activity can all really help you on the SEO side and beyond. Because listen, a lot of the times, and I, I know it's like heretical to say this, but a business might not be ready for the SEO success that the SEO is promising them. They need to build that cadence on social or on YouTube or whatever it is. So slicing and dicing all of that content and distributing it outside of the momentum and the branding aspect of it can really help supplement the website's growth until it's ready and mature enough for SEO. Very good point. Amazing. Totally agree. Ulrika, do you, do you have anything to add? Yeah. So I I'm continue on that. Like use whatever things you already created and use it in different formats so that and use one piece like multiple times instead of creating multiple pieces for each format, uh, which is what you should do and, and how you spend your, your time, which is equal money. So, of course, people are not on the same platform. They are on different platforms and also different users and your audience or have different uh, needs or, or places to be. And if you want to brand for all of those platforms, you should repurpose your content, obviously. Great. Um, Joe, uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would like to. Uh, we've also got some messages in the chat. Yeah, building Nifasha is talking about building video pages and adding a video sitemap. That's always a good thing to have as well. Um, so it's easier to, to crawl your content. What I wanted to say is about uh, this question specifically is that, um, yeah, emphasizing what or um, what Mordi and Erika said, it's also about building your personal brand. And actually, Tima did an excellent presentation at MozCon last week about building your uh, brand. It's about, you know, you can repurpose your content and it's totally fine to do that. You need to be known as the expert in your field. Um, I do really like what Moz did for Whiteboard Friday. I thought that was great uh, because there's a lot of people that maybe can't read, um, can't listen to videos as well. So it was great that they also had the transcript. Um, and it also then links to, of course, other videos that they've done. Um, I think if you can focus, if you can, with any of your sort of marketing strategy, make sure that you write a plan for it. And if you have video in that, then really try and dedicate some resource to that. Like um, creating sort of uh, one or two videos is not enough. Look at doing like a series, like Morty was doing about um, the SERPs Up podcast or also about the SEO rant that uh, Morty set up in 2020. And now it's got 118 episodes or, you know, what we've been doing here, you know, this is now our 29th episode to be consistent with that, but put that back into your marketing plan. Great. Uh, and I just want to say, like some of the some of the repurposing is so easy. Like if you have a podcast, YouTube has a great thing where you just take the RSS feed and it uploads all the videos. I uploaded like 115 videos in like a few hours. It was great in one click. Um, repurposing, like creating audiograms out of your podcast content. There's a great tool called Headliner. If you know, even if you don't want to pay for it, I think it gives you like 10 free audiograms a month. There's so much out there to help you repurpose it, and it. it if you're uploading a video blog, like we do a thing with, I'm going to pitch something. Um, it's new. We do a video series with Barry Schwartz, Mondays through Thursdays. I'm pretty sure Barry uploads that to a podcast feed also. It's just taking the audio from the YouTube. It's 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 one click, two clicks, no big deal. Why not? Great. So, so I, I slightly disagree if that's okay. Um, Ooh. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we obviously do this. We do SEO office hours and the only place it goes is on YouTube. And um, I've been asked many times whether I'm going to turn it into a podcast or something like that. Um, but I, I kind of think that when it comes to each channel, I like to sort of try and come up with something unique and give someone a reason to sort of watch something on YouTube or um, you know, go and 
we don't have a podcast but if we did we i would hope that we'd have something there would be a reason why you would also go and subscribe there and not uh not just on youtube M maybe i'm missing out but where, yeah when, whenever we're working on things i always try and think what um why would somebody go in watch this on youtube as well as sign up on spotify as well as you know go here and there and so on um so the i i, I agree but i d disagree in a sense that what, what i would do is there's a lot of different types of content here in the question so you've got webinars interviews uh, product demos workshops and so on and what, what i would say is i would put them where they make the most sense so for example, I don't know, product demos, it makes sense that that really just features on your website and on those kind of key pages. Whereas maybe interviews might be something that I would repurpose from take, put on YouTube, but also repurpose into podcasts and so and, and so on. Uh, behind the scenes footage, that feels like something that you, people want to see. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I think there's also that element of um, if you find the channel that really works for what you're doing, um, I'd also try and make the most of that as well. That That's just um, a, a slightly different perspective, but um, yeah. Joe, do we have anything in the chat? Yeah, we have um, <laughs> Simon saying, you really should podcast this, Mike. I'm with, I'm with Simon. Yeah, More maybe I'm just <laughs> um, We have from Dean. Uh, yeah, I'd add that. Make sure you can keep it up, not just, yeah, one and done. One and done uh, approach. Go. You need to basically be consistent with it. There's lots of tools out there to help you repurpose, repurpose content in different formats, find and nail down a solid um, process that you can use that can be replicated by anyone. And, oh, quite a lot of chat actually coming in. Uh, yeah, Chris is saying that's a great way to explain it, Morty. He's going to uh, probably pinch that uh, idea. And... Yeah, I think, well, Chris is also saying I see the value of both ways, but I have also caught up with a missed SEO office hours on YouTube while out walking. So, you know, I mean, I think with the thing with that, this repurposing content on different platforms, you do need to link back to that marketing strategy, which means you've got the time to do that. Um, and you want to maybe um, sort of take a sort of a, perhaps a different angle. Uh, but yeah, that's we've got lots of interaction in the chat. So uh, back to you, Mike. I, th I think also when it comes to podcasts, audio quality really matters. And with with this office hours, obviously, you know, I don't have a, a special mic or anything like that. And I don't think any any of you guys yeah. do. Either. And I think I it do. works really. Oh, you oh. do. Okay. Oh. Um, but I, th I, I, I think if we were going to turn this into a podcast, I would really think about, OK, well, what would the listener that can't see this um, uh, want? But yeah, I. I I don't, I don't know. I think I think um, personally, I just try and find what works in different places. Um, OK, next. Uh, oh, I like this. Hello, Michael, Joe and special guests. Um, are there any good mobile phone apps you would recommend for monitoring analytics and KPIs on the go? Who would like to? It, does anybody monitor from their phone? Save your soul. Just leave your phone alone. <laughs> I, I, I that, that that was that was going to be my feedback actually i um yeah I, years never ago, break from it yeah years ago i used to have um analytics there was like a an app that i could pull analytics data into and you just become obsessed with it and i think it's really unhealthy whereas actually you know once a day or however often logging in and having a look feel <laughs> feels more manageable um Ulrika, do you have anything on your phone that you're that you're looking at every 10 minutes um no i, I also used the uh, analytics tool or analytics app a couple of years ago or many years ago when i started um doing <laughs> so what i did was like showing the the client on my mobile phone because that seemed fancy so this was like yeah a long time ago um, but nowadays, no, I want to be, I want to have my big screen and everything when I look at the, the KPIs and the data, because the phones, you can't really see stuff. So what I would do, if I needed that, I would probably create a Looker Studio report that I could log into and easily see a simple, you know, charts and bars and stuff if, yeah, if I need that. But yeah. I, this is one example of desktop being more um, useful, <laughs> in my opinion. 
That's a very good point, Ilker. I was just going to say, actually, what I would do on a mobile is sometimes I like to like look at the data just yeah. to have like a second pair of eyes. So I would have already like exported a report from Google Looker Studio and have the PDF version to look at. And sometimes you can see some anomalies because sometimes it's actually kind of nice just to take a step back. But um, in terms of app, I'd like to try and uh, not uh, put loads of things on like on my uh, phone keep it app free as much as possible yeah uh, we've also got from um simon uh said that kprs are going to be individual to each business so as Arika said uh, looker studio dashboard would be would be good and uh, actually dean saying that he almost uh downloaded the seo ranking app actually the other day so that could be a good possibility but um yeah he also agrees with me that sometimes it's yeah good to take a step back so you can actually look at the report that you've done and it can help actually for you to come up with extra insights too. Great, thank you for those. Uh, next next question, um, is it best practice to use relative or, or absolute URLs for redirects? We are currently at the pre-migration stage. Um, does it does it matter? Um, Ulrika, you're, you're smiling, what's yeah, that? Yeah, it does matter a lot. <laughs> do not do relative uh, link re redirects, use absolute redirects um this can i, I don't want to swear when we are doing but it, it can f up stuff a lot <laughs> don't do it <laughs> um it, it can be okay if you are having a modern platform that can actually handle it but it can also not be okay depending on what that redirect is used for um so we are now um, with one client building a very like modern, latest version of everything, React page or site. And uh, we're using some relative links uh, for some stuff. And it actually doesn't really know when to resolve the domain and the protocol. Um, so sometimes it prints the relative link in places where like and and the the like in schema for example and it doesn't that doesn't work and so you never know so you always use absolute links especially when you're doing things like redirects um, the server will probably not resolve the, the the protocol and the domain it could if it's a if it's taught that way but it doesn't have to be that way and you know then stuff happens that you didn't anticipate so and it's important that people get to the right place right not a four -four. do you have any thoughts i mean it just like in general there's i i think the pros for using absolute urls is from an seo point of view far more than than relevant like you know from duplicate content point of view it, it, you know what it feels like to me i don't know if someone disagrees with like maybe i'm being a little bit of a curmudgeon here saying this i'm gonna use a sports analogy you, you catch the ball, you're playing basketball, you steal the ball, you run down the court. You could just, you know, lay it in there, or slam dunk it in there, fine. <laughs> or you could do like a 360 flip spin move. And if it works, you look great. But if it doesn't work, <laughs> you look a total idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it compared to basketball before, but that's a very good one. I like it. Um, yeah, uh, Dean was just uh, laughing out loud for what you said. Uh, Rick, I'm sorry for that. Perfect. No, it's great. <laughs> it's good. Um, Albert's saying, yep, absolute URLs. It is. End of discussion. Uh, Simon's bringing in the whole depends. He didn't say it depends, but he still used the word depends. Depends on the system. Some only allow relative links. And unless it is a rubbish React site, it should be okay. I don't agree here because uh, it could be like a vanilla HTML site wouldn't be able to resolve it either. So, and there's a bunch of, and I know I've worked with um, Magento sites that does not resolve it. And so bunch of bunch of systems does not understand this and resolve it properly. They do resolve something, but it doesn't, don't, they don't resolve it properly. So go with absolute things. Um, that's All right. Okay, great. I have times. nothing else to add to that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, ne next question. Uh, we we operate in the B two B travel space, and have been asked if we'd like to sponsor an event, and they've given us a URL. Joe, are you able to share that URL? Is that okay in the chat? Yes. Um, 
they, you know, but basically the audience is essentially their potential customers. Um, and they'd like to know if we've got any ideas on how to make sponsoring an event work from an SEO perspective. Um, is can you get any SEO benefits? Has anybody got any? Has anybody done anything like this before? Um, Mordi Wix sponsor quite a lot of events. I was at Blue Array's um, event yesterday, their conference, and I had a Wix lanyard around my neck. What um, do, is that? Do you do anything? Do you get any SEO benefit out of doing stuff like that? Yeah, we're doing it for the backlinks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We don't think of. I mean, again, they get all all part of your digital light kind of thing, but we don't look at it from an SEO point of view. Um, either we're looking at it from, I'll just I'll, like pull the curtain back a bit. Either we're looking at it from like a KPI point of view, like our target audience is there, or we're looking at it as from a community point of view. Like we feel like you can't just take from the community. You actually have to give back in a genuine way. So like, for example, we like sponsoring, not just like the bright in SEOs of the world, but smaller, more local events as well, because we do feel like it's important not just to take, but also to give back. I'm not just saying that. I know it sounds like a cliche thing to say as a company man has to say that, but I we generally believe that. That's we call our, it that's local washing. What's that? Instead of green washing, that would be like local business washing. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, but like for real, like it's not like SEO doesn't factor into like our sponsoring strategy. Maybe uh, it should. No, it shouldn't. I've I've done that a couple of times with companies and, and it really works. And then you get a you get a really nice spot on on a place where your audience is and this which is nice but you also help the organization or the event which is very nice especially if it's a nice event that you want to sponsor and so that gives nice branding and uh being top of mind for the right people that you want to be top of mind of but also there's links back and which is nice and don't don't over focus on the links also focus on the mentions together with the, this brand and or the event i mean i don't see any downsides unless it's a bad event if it's a good event a nice event then just plus and positive positiveness for seo yes Great. joe what about what, what about you because you're about... you you sponsor events and you also run events um do, do you get any feedback from people that this has really helped from an seo perspective I, so back to like for the first question, sponsor event. So my company turned global. We're very small um, and we sponsored Search Africon. We sponsor the SCDC. Uh, we also sponsor the event Search and Stuff. We are doing these because it is, it is good to be involved in a community. It's good to help others. I'm not doing it from like, oh, I'm going to get some links back and no. stuff like that. No, I want to help others because there's a lot of massive events, but these these other events that I mentioned, they're run by individual people. They don't have a lot of sponsorship. So I'm not looking really for anything in particular from this. I want to pay it forward. I know that these are great events and it's a great brand awareness. You can see that you've got um, more mentions using a, you know, a social media tool, like uh, Rika said. You can see that you have get more traffic coming from social it's always good to diversify the traffic. And of course, you can see that you may be invited to speak or take part in other opportunities too. When it comes to um, Search London, I've been running that for now, it's in its 14th year. And we have our, I have set up the online events um, for four years and also Search Barcelona for actually one year now. And with brands coming involved, they're, they're already getting access to an immediate community. They don't need to organize anything. We have a target audience. We have actually 50 people coming to our summer event on uh, Monday. But what we're looking for is to have partnerships so we can actually grow this um, further because it's an independently owned organization like the Search Africon, uh, Search and Stuff and FCDC. Someone doing it in their free time. It's not They're not being paid for it. But in order to then be able to like grow events, it's important to have the backing from companies to allow yourself to then have people to pay people to come to the event, to, to tweet more about it, to have an actual social media person coverage it. And when you have things like that at events, then you can actually see a lot more reach. Um, but of course, it's like catch 22 uh, situation. Great. Um. So I, I guess there are a couple of direct things when when you sponsor an event usually you feature on the events website and so you've got um, a relevant website writing about your business and and what you do and 
um, hopefully sharing some of the, the the sort of cool things that you do as a business. So I guess from that perspective, it might help. There might be a, a sort of slight vote of confidence there. I think um, if if I was you, I'd be trying to think about like creative ways um, when you're at at that event about some things that you can do. So maybe um, interview some people, like you know, get some get some content, get photos at the event that potentially you could use on your site. Um, review the event. Maybe it's a case that um you you if you're speaking at the event try and get hold of that footage and maybe use it on your site or use it on youtube or something like that so um i think if 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 this is you know if you're looking at sponsorship as a way of um could this be a way that we grow from an seo perspective i think i think this this is just one of many things that you could do to build your brand that i think will help you um with seo but I think you can also come up with some creative ways, like work with the sponsor. We're actually sponsoring um, some cakes at Search London on Monday, um, some cupcakes. And we've got, you know, we've kind of made them fun and that kind of stuff. Well, I don't think our rankings are going to change because of it, if I'm honest, Joe. But, yeah, you know, no. like cake. And it gives me a chance to sort of meet people who... Um, uh, come to SA office hours, but um, could be potential customers in the future. Um, and also just tell them a bit about us and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to cake. I've, I've, um, I've, I've designed them. So I'm quite excited about what they end up looking at. Like, don't worry, I'm not baking them though. A professional is doing that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're having a Buckley's Bakery. Yeah. So it depends on sort of maybe what sponsorship package you have. So um, many events offer different things where, yeah, cupcake sponsor, or you can do a fresh sponsor, or a lot of companies have like networking sponsor, uh, Search Africon, there was networking sponsor. There was also media sponsor too. So at least thing, you know, events can be recorded. So yeah, um, the main thing with sponsoring events is uh, you're 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 helping others in the community. Uh, you're paying it forward. You have more brand exposure, and also you're getting all of that without you having to organize the event yourself. So you can meet lots of different contacts. Everyone loves going to events, especially if you don't organize them. But I do like going to my events too. Just think if the 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 coffee stand at Brighton SEO, if they did a thing where they were just like, you can only have a coffee if you give us a link or something like that. Think about all the links that they get. Okay, uh, next next question. Okay, it's been reported to me that we have broken links on our website. Is there an easier way to spot them than checking manually? Um, that's screaming that's, frog. Uh, screaming frog. Ulrika says. Any anything else? There's a lot of there's like a uh, an extension that I've been using for years. I don't remember what it's called. Hold on, it's called Check My Links. Mm. Just run the you know you have it on a it's a Chrome extension. You're looking at a page. It'll run all the backlinks for you on the page. Mm, that's a good one. I may, Check I may, my links. And, so, and most uh, SEO uh, tools or platforms, they do that for you as well. So um, just in case the person asking isn't an SEO, um, and say, for instance, they've got, because they're saying broken links on the website uh, mm. that it's been reported to them. So Ulrika just said Screaming Frog, which is just a tool that can crawl your website and pick them out. A crawler tool, yes. And... Of course, if you're not in SEO, that can be a bit daunty to, to download and open and run. Um, so in that case, if you're not into SEO or are not used to these tools, um, maybe you could check in the Google Search Console where you see in the report of um, issues, there you can see which one the broken pages, the 404s, they're called 404s broken pages. Uh, check the ones that Google has, or or you can also do it in Bing uh, Webmaster Tools. Check the ones that search engine has picked up and um, yeah, locate them. But it is easier if you have a tool like Screaming Frog. And if you're not accustomed to use it, um, reach out to a freelancer SEO to do it. It won't take that much time for them to do it. So yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not, it's not, it won't be very costly. Screaming Frog is free for under 500 URLs. So that's a really good point. Um, also, there's reports and other tools that you can use and they will tell you if it's broken links or not. I also wanted to say a, a welcome and thank you for everyone joining us on the replay. And if you are enjoying the show, um, you can join us live and uh, sign up. I will share the link in the transcript. You can sign up on Good Signals and join us live and take part in this fun chat. And uh, and I also want to say, I think we actually now have one of our biggest, definitely to date, in-person or live attendees. 
and I'll share in the chat where we're all dialing in from. But yeah, definitely this is the first coming over from New Zealand. Uh, I wonder if we have anybody out uh, west, like New York side, so that we can see how many hours we've got between uh, New Zealand and uh, New York. But uh, I'll write it in the chat where everyone's dialing in from. Great. OK, next question. Um, in a period where AI tools have been developing rapidly over the last two years, they've not only improved processes in terms of SEO, but they've also contributed to a huge amount of junk on the Internet. How should SEOers adapt in the future to survive and develop? Um, who, who would like to kick off on this one? I don't even know what to say about this whole AI stuff anymore. I'll be honest. It's like it's kind of gotten out of control. Like all, like all of a sudden, like, like what, when I want it, I, again, I'm like terrible time. I don't know my own anniversary, but I don't know. Like, it's been two years, year and a half is the whole chat GPT thing as if crap on the yeah. web didn't exist before that. <laughs> but it's, there's a lot more now. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to make crap. It's really it's easier really to make crap. Easy. But, but it's, it's, I would also say it's it's easier to make good stuff as well. Like you can, um, True. you know, if you haven't got a big team, you know, you can use some of these tools to help feedback and help with the research and, and that side of things, which, but that there is, there is also a lot of crap <laughs> with these. I'll, I'll steal this idea from Ross Hudgens, who we had on one of our webinars, and he's basically saying, like, if you give AI, like, uh, like boundaries to work within, right, you know, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, give it, you know, here's a paragraph, write a title for this paragraph, it has less chance of, like, just going off the handle. So it's a matter of like, yeah, use AI, just like use it in a kind of like, you know, write a blog post or, you know, tell me the best this, like give it, it's like children. You yeah. have to give it like very specific instructions or your house will burn down. I agree. Like use AI with caution, like, or, or train it very well, be good at using AI in, in, in what ways you want to use it, but also like, um, yeah, proofread, check and everything and rewrites and maybe not using it so much as a writer, but maybe a research tool, which is amazing, is really good at that. It, it really saves hours using AI as a researcher tool, or, you know? I also use it for um, like semantically connect um, different products for my e-commerce sites. Uh, so where I can enrich different types of products or create new categories based on certain scenarios that I point out. So that that's a way to use it. Um, we are not creating crap with that. <laughs> We're no. just doing manual work more easily. Can, can I confess something? Like, no, one, no one judge me here, please. I, I use of it. Of course a, not. My title tag creator, whatever, to write my meta descriptions because I hate writing meta descriptions. I don't think they like, who cares. Ooh. I might have done that <laughs> too. <laughs> is that horrible? Does it make me a bad person? <laughs> no, no, I've no. heard that you don't have to, you know, spend that much time on just... meta descriptions anymore because, you know, they are going to be rewritten anyways. Just put whatever good stuff you want on it. I'm just tired. Yeah. I'm just tired. I need something. Yeah. I need like one thing like here. Like I'm, I feel like I'm like I'm getting ahead of the game. I'm cheating. Aha, I did it. So if you had advice, so this person says, how should SEOers, um, I've not heard of SEOs being called that before, but SEOers, how do we, how do we, how do we grow? How do we develop with AI? Are you, I, I, like Moz did a really good um, series actually um, with Chima where uh, different webinars of how different people in SEO are using these tools, uh, which I th thought was really good. That they, they were they're a couple of months old now, but um, that 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 could be something. So I would learn how to embrace them, but um, and and use them to their full benefit. Um, Joe, have you got any thoughts? Well, actually, just from reading the chat, it's quite it's there's a lot going on. So uh, we have um. We have, uh, yeah, Simon's saying, grow, grow your own food, build a bunker and huddle down. Um, <laughs> Preeti's saying, I'm planning to move to the mountains. Uh, John's talking about create a blog post uh, that's 100% human written. Um, and we also have uh, uh, Manure, he's talking about uh, that SEO professionals should adopt to AI and automation by focusing on quality content, use AI for data analysis and automation, like uh, Arika and Morty have said. Uh, but emphasize the e -A -E 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 -A -T. Um, but obviously, you know, promoting that as human part of your content. 
Albert says use AI for proofreading. Yeah, that's actually quite a good point. Does anyone use Grammarly? You know, a lot of people, isn't that AI? And I was thinking before the whole AI officially sort of kicked off, what about when we're using different tools? You know, like um, they, they come up with like the long tail keywords. I remember when I was working at Search Metrics like five years ago, we had um, people coming, you you type in a word and it would come up with longer tail uh, keywords as well off the back of it or broader keywords. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, Riaz is talking about uh, SEO users should focus on creating yeah, high quality, valuable content and leveraging. So leveraging this AI for better optimization um, and leveraging user experiences stand out amidst this increase in junk content. But yeah, back to what you said, actually, Morty. Yeah, there's always been junk out there. So um, it's not anything new. It's just, yeah, of course, maybe easy way to way to do that. Um, Simon's saying, how on earth do we build websites for computers? It's all AI. Yeah, so uh, lots of things. I actually also have a question as well um afterwards uh from from the uh, chat just about uh google trends if we can ask that afterwards yeah do you want to go for that should we start yeah so this is actually back at the um so as everyone's talking about from the blue river event yesterday that both you you guys went to i don't know if you yeah. met up um but uh daniel weisberg was at the blue array event and he was discussing the changes coming to google trends uh, this is a tool that's often overlooked at the agency where he works. How much do you all, audience here, everyone here, uh, use Google Trends and how do you use its insights? Um, so I'll actually open the floor, floor to, to Rika if you want to, because your your company is based on putting the user first um, for yeah. the SEO. So I actually use Google Trends a lot. Um, in different ways <laughs> for different purposes. Um, so one way is checking uh, what is what, how are people searching for something? Like, are they searching for this or that? Like more often than when on, over the year? And is something trending like over the year or not? Is something picking up or not, et cetera. But then I also scroll down and see what are the, the keywords or the the uh, expressions that I, that is connected to whatever I've been like searching for. Uh, I, I do get a lot of, I usually do this when I pick out seed keywords. So I don't do actual keyword analysis on this. I pick, I, it helps me finding seed keywords uh, that I then um, use for, for the actual uh, analysis. It's also interesting to see where, uh, so I do check on the map, where have people searched more for this? Where is it more so that I can localize uh, accordingly? Um, the other thing that I'm using it for is when I work on news uh, websites or magazines, uh, you check constantly like what's trending right now uh, and what is what is hot at the moment. Uh, is that something that the, the, the editors should pick up and write about? Uh, so that is a process that I actually, yeah, I recommend them to, to be doing a few couple of times per day, check Google Trends to see if something is picking up. If, if there's something in their niche that is new and trendy. Um, yeah, that's great, thank you. And I also wanna just emphasize the fact with like Google Trends is I would say it's really important, especially for like new products. Like, you know, if it's a Christmas, you know, the crazy Christmas gift, that, you know, the kids yeah. want, or, um, you know, things like iPhone, different iPhones. No one's, no one searched for iPhone before it came out, um, you know, back yeah. in the day. And so it's really something that should be looked on uh, for like new products. And uh, it will, it's still important to, to obviously optimize for those terms, even though it doesn't have, you know, much search volume now. Search volume. Yeah, exactly. And that, and the whole discussion around search volume, which I think is a bit misleading because we don't actually know where that number comes from or what it means and how much, and how much back in the days is it from, how, how much historical is that number of search volume? I I hear people say that they know and they say that this is like very clear that this and that. Um, I'm from a country where we don't we there are not many people in the world that speak Swedish. <laughs> so search volume in Sweden is like not often very high because we are not that many. Still, people do search for products in Swedish. And if I do uh, optimize for 
for Swedish products in Swedish, they do get traffic and conversions. So, and still don't have any search volume. So do not go blindly checking search volume, but it can help to see like in, in trends, if, if there's something coming up or if there's something else, some other term that is connected to it that you can use, et cetera, et cetera. So. Great. Um, we, we use Google Trends for things like, um, it, you know, if we're doing digital PR campaigns and it's about sort of, uh, you know, trending uh, topics or we're trying to do comparisons, if, if there's a new story, it can be quite helpful to kind of actually bring a story to life. Um, so, so that's one way. I remember somebody speaking at Search London, Joe, around... Um, they work for a fashion brand and they were saying they use Google Trends as a way of identifying, you know, colors and things like that, that people are talking about and the growth of certain, um, you know, certain brands or certain colors, which I thought was was really useful. And um, Daniel's talk yesterday was really good. Um, I think Blue, historically Blue Array have given the um, uh, videos from their from their talks for free um so look out I, I know they do a newsletter so it might be worth signing up and um and seeing if you can get access to it um great did anybody else want to add anything or should we jump on to the next question i mean we we basically use it i like to use it for like for like branding i'll give you like an actual like like example so i said i'm i'll stay on brand as a sports example so major league baseball recently sent two teams to play in the uk they sent the phillies and the mets just to give you an understanding of what that actually is like the phillies would be like sending like beyonce to meet martians for the first time and sending the mets is like sending boris johnson and hoping things work out well and you can you could see in google trends like okay the the there's a spike in interest you type in the word baseball in the uk and what i'll do is what i like to look at it's like how long did that last for does it immediately fall off is there still a chatter a few days later or whatever it is and you see it immediately falls off the next day because you saw what major league baseball is or you saw our version of it where we sent you the mets so of course no one talked about it the next day it was the mets but you can use it to see like how impactful like topic really is by looking at a longer trends, but looking if there's an event or something like, I don't mean an event, like literally like an event where you go and do something like some kind of like unique aspect to that branding or that activity. How long does it last for and how long is it, how, or how quick is it to fall off? That kind of thing. Um, by, by the way, also, I get a really cool uh, newsletter from, it's, I think it's from the Google Trends team, actually. Um, and you made me think of it, Morty, because they the last one was about trends around the UK election. And you were just talking about Boris Johnson. Um, and, and that's really cool. And it might inspire some stories or um, some content that you're doing. But that's worth signing up for. Um, it's yeah, it is from the Google Trends team, so it's worth just maybe googling that. Um, Joe, do you yeah, have anything to add? Yeah, we have actually from Dean. It's a really good point. He raised. Um, he's used Google Trends before to check if the keyword means uh, the same thing in different countries. So, what could we call a certain product, a certain name in one country? Um, it could be different in Australia versus in in, in the United K Kingdom as well. So that's actually quite good. Yeah. It, I've made those uh, mistakes living in those countries, calling it different something else. Um, yeah, and the newsletter, what you just said, John, just saying it's fun. Yeah, it's uh, limited to some countries for now, but um, hoping it can change. Great. Um, and Daniel's talk yesterday, he talked about cheese. So if you like cheese, there was lots of cheese examples uh, using Google Trends. I'm I'm from a place called Cheddar in Somerset, where Cheddar Cheese is from. So I was, I was a big fan of that. Um, okay, next question. Um, Five we, minutes left. Ah, so, okay, we're going to try and fit two questions in. Um, so we'll try and be as quick as we can on this one, um, although it's fairly kind of serious. So um, we have out, we have an outdated staging website that still appears in the search results. How can we effectively remove it entirely from, um, from search? I've done that multiple times. Great, Ulrika, go Let for it. Let me tell you how I do it. And it it's done in one hour. <laughs> hey, perfect. Put like do all do all your redirects that you want to, or like and that kind of thing from the staging, or if it's like a staging and you accidentally indexed it, that this is what happened probably. Uh, take it down for for it. Uh, put no index and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, make sure that you know it's not indexable anymore. In a way, the 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 easiest thing is just to take it down, put a 404 on it. And then you go to Google Search Console and then you put in there 
please remove this these uh, links from the from the SERP. And then that's gonna last for a couple of months, and then they're gonna recrawl it. And but if you then have removed it and put all the no index robots removed it, you know, all of the things that you should, they are not going to re-index it. So then it's gone within the hour. Great. Um, Mordi, you're nodding. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I was thinking, I'm looking in the uh, first off, if you do just the removal in search console, as Lucas said, like it's only going to last 90 days. So yeah. You have to do the other things also. Yeah. Um, or if you want to keep, if you do want to keep the content there for your users, you just password protect it, or Simon said password mm. protect your devs. But um, then someone asked in the chat about 404s versus 410s, and I feel awkward answering this because I think it was John who talked about this and Barry. Yeah, I actually had a conversation with John about this in uh, uh, one of the I'm search out. central. So yeah. I'll repeat what he said. Okay. <laughs> So when you have a 404, they're going to try uh recrawl it a couple of times, and then they're going to like give up. Uh, if, if it's still like not there the fifth time or so, or so, or even before, uh, they're going to take it out of the index. The 410 can, can be um, somewhat um, hard to, to do if you, unless you have like, you know what you're doing and you have the developers and everything, but I've experienced that it's not always they want to do it because it's, it's costly and everything to do it. And I don't know why, because I'm not a developer. In my book, it's like easy, but it's not probably. Um, so 410, yes. But then if you decide that, oh, wait a minute, we need this page, then that's going to be hard to re-index with the 404. Oh, we need this page. Activate it again, and it's going to be easier re-indexed. So <laughs> with history in mind, <laughs> if, if you really do something bad and you don't, you really want to kill it. Yes, 410, it's going to cost some, but bring cake to developers. Uh, if you don't know, go with 404. Because it's going to re, this it's going to disappear after a while anyways. And how serious is the, is the staging website in the index? How, how serious? It can be very, it can, it can actually be, uh, it's not for SEO, so much but okay so you are leading the the users to the wrong place maybe they cannot buy stuff there maybe it's misinformation etc but you can also uh leave doors open for hackers or other exploiters uh with things that you didn't foresee uh they can find ways into your systems that you didn't really like check because staging is not proper product the, the it's not a proper product page like or the live page where you have all the security instances installed so never have a staging in because you don't in the SERPs or in, in the index that's uh it, it's important great um joe is there anything in the chat before we move on to the very last question which we've got about two minutes or under two minutes no let's move on to that very exciting and important last question it's the regular question which is basically what are you most excited about from an seo point of view um Mordi, what are you most excited about at the moment in terms of seo i think i think the seo conversation has a little you know matured a bit i don't want to give seos too much credit but um i think to a certain extent, it's matured a bit. We're not just talking about like, you know, links and, you know, optimizing headers, but we are talking about wider marketing practices a lot more than we used to. And I find that exciting. Great. Ulrika? I, I, me too. I, 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 I really enjoy that as well. But I also enjoy the, the thing that I enjoy with AI and the whole talk about that is that now, because I studied linguistics back in the days at the, at the uni, um, and I get to finally have some some use of my university university studies. So I, I studied uh, generative grammar. <laughs> and I use that a lot now than when I work with entities and uh, semantic SEO, uh, because I do understand it, because I studied it a lot and I nerded down in it. That, that's my nerd corner. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like that. And I like that we're talking more about like knowledge graphs and working with knowledge panels, because for in my view, that is a technical layer of branding. And that suits me perfectly. I, I really like that. 
Am I Great. Um, Joe, we haven't got time. I'm sorry, but I'm yes. assuming you're going to say events. And I'm going to say events. W well, <laughs> WTS Fest is last week, last Friday, first one in Berlin and also London XL yesterday. And of course, Search London coming up this uh, Monday in central London. And also thank you everyone for joining us. We had 35 live attendees, our biggest yet, and dialing in from 14 countries. Wow. Great. Thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you everybody for joining. For those watching afterwards on YouTube, thank you, Joe. Um, have a lovely weekend and we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.